Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Prosperity Through Multifamily Real Estate Investing Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Cody Laughlin, and filling in for John this morning is my partner, Mr. Brian Alfaro. Brian, how are we doing this morning? I'm doing excellent. Thanks for having me, Cody. Yeah, man, absolutely. Looking forward to our conversation. And I kind of wish we were sitting on the beach where uh, Shannon is back there, but... Uh, <laughs> But uh, before, we, before we get to our very special guest, uh, I want to remind everyone to please make sure to jump over to Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. Make sure to subscribe to the show and leave us a quick written rating and review. We really appreciate your feedback. Also, if we have not connected with you, we'd love to do so. Uh, we are on Facebook, LinkedIn, and you can follow us on Instagram. And if you'd like to learn more about me, Brian, and John, and what we've got going on at Blue Oak uh, Capital and how you could potentially invest with us, Check us out at www.blueoakinvest.com. Now, with our very special guest today, Mr. Shannon Rubnett. Did I say that right, Shannon? Yep. Awesome, man. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thanks for having me, guys. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, man. Looking forward to diving into your story and your background. But uh, before we get to that, let me tell the listeners a little bit more about you. Um, Shannon has been in the real estate industry for over 40 years. He has been involved from start to finish in over $200 million in construction projects covering the gamut from multifamily, professional office buildings, to city halls, fire and police stations, schools, industrial, and many storage. Shannon says that there is phenomenal growth in just building, filling, and selling a product. Shannon further explains that his operation is different than most because he is looking for syndicating, excuse me, syndication partners that are seeking tax advantage situations and his main clients are using IRAs to invest, not clients looking for small monthly cash flow investments. Uh, we're definitely gonna have to dive into that, Shannon. <laughs> <laughs> um, another reason Shannon is different is that the majority of the projects are ground up development. So he, he and his team have streamlined the ground up process, making it much more lucrative, uh, a much more lucrative product to invest in. Uh, he and his team also have completely rehabbed building from pipes, roof, window paint, everything that will keep these rehab investments profitable for 10 plus years. So Shannon, again, tell us a little bit more about your story, buddy. Well, um, to clear up a couple of things, I, I have been in the real estate game for 40 years in the sense that my dad was a, a, a general contractor in California and my mom was a real estate agent when we moved to Idaho in 1980. So I saw deals getting done at the table, you know, kind of like if you were Charlie Sheen's kids and you saw, you know, things happening. That's, that was kind of my life, right? I mean, I was seeing 1031 exchanges done at a very young age that, you know, and, and selling this and buying that. And so I always kind of had that growing up that that was my experience. And so when I, when I did my first deal at 21, it just seemed natural. It just seemed normal. I, I bought the piece of ground next to a job site that I was on because my crane guy needed a place to park and there was a an older lady and her son that were selling the property and I got it rezoned and you know I, I didn't write a check for five hundred dollars for an earnest money that was out of my savings account it was the only five hundred dollars I had and you know I was newly married and I had a I had a brand new baby and I was I mean broke was not even close to the word but I bought that piece of ground on contract and I was able to get it rezoned and I was able to sell it and in that sale I made more doing that than I did work in that whole year and I really saw there where development was my golden goose. It was the thing that was going to get me beyond being a contractor. I mean, not that contracting isn't lucrative, but like any job, it's lucrative. But what are you going to do to make the large swipes uh, that, that are going to take you to that next level that are really going to, um, you know, increase your, your bandwidth? And so that's kind of when I saw that, that that was what happened. And, you know, from there, you know, like you read in my bio, I've done over $200 million in sales of my own. These have been things where I've been either the buyer or the seller moving back and forth in and out of the industry of moving product and, and creating something, buying a piece of land and building the buildings on it and then stabilizing it with tenants and then selling it back into the market. I mean, that's just kind of, you know, how my game works. And, and that's really been my experience. And it's been a lot of fun. It really has been a lot of fun. Has it been any headache along the way? Well, of course. Come on, <laughs> Cody. <laughs> well, you know, Absolutely. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, this is a fun topic where I'm, I'm excited. We're talking about this. You're, you're the first developer that we've had on the show. And, and, you know, I think 
most of us, uh, you know, ourselves included, have an interest in development, but, um, you know, understanding that it's just a different ballgame, right? I mean, it's a lot yeah. different than going and buying an existing, uh, you know, brick and mortar that's already in place. So let's kind of dive into that. What does it take to get a development project done? Well, you know, Cody, the thing that everybody thinks, you know, if you go to a job site and you ask my plumber who's making all the money, he's going to say it's the excavation guy. And then you go to ask the ex excavator and he's going to say, well, you know, it's the roofer. He's making all the money. You know, everybody thinks everybody else is making all the money. But the, the truth of the matter is when you do a development, you know, when you go buy a brick and mortar, you're buying somebody else's upside. Somebody else had it before you. They got it to this level. Maybe they've let it get dilapidated with some, you know, some, some vacancy and, and, and they've got some, you know, deferred maintenance. But you're really still paying a lot more for it than it costs to build when it was built but when you're doing when you're doing a ground up development you are getting that first cutting of of the upside and you know when when we went in we were getting ready to start a 190 unit apartment complex uh right across from a 54 acre park in meridian and uh this is in idaho where we where we do all our development uh and when we went into the city we had the ability from the city code to put in 100 or 270 units. By the time the city and the neighbors got done, we were able to get 190. And so, and this was an 18 month process, right? I mean, we, we found some discrepancies in a survey. So we had to go back to the county and we had to rectify that. And then we had, you know, services we had to deal with. So it, it's, a, it's a little bit more of a process. I mean, I hear, I hear you know, stories of, of you guys finding a deal on, you know, tomorrow, Thursday, being under contract on Monday on something you didn't know about, out fundraising for it and closing on it in 90 days. That's not really, that's not really in the development pipeline. So it's kind of a good and a bad thing, right? Because I don't get freaked out because all of a sudden on Tuesday, I gotta, I gotta find another $10 million, right? I know, for, I know for a little bit of time that I've got this project coming down the pipe and what it's gonna take to do that. But to give you a further example, we're doing a 36 unit project right now um, in, in Nampa, Idaho. And my build costs on the project is $5.3 million. That's land, that's financing, that's all of our construction, that's you know, lease up, that's, that's interest, that's the whole, the whole ball of wax. The nice thing about new construction is I don't have to believe my my own spreadsheet or drink my own Kool-Aid because I get an appraisal with every loan I get. And so the lender says that the, the minute that project's done in December of 19, he told us that uh, w that project would be worth $6.3 million. So I can do the math right there and go, if there's no appreciation between then and now, there's a million dollars to be made with doing nothing. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people look at that and they go, well, okay, but, but you know, ground up is not as not as safe and it's you know it's it's more dangerous there's more risk involved and i would say completely the contrary you know um i mean you you can ask anybody that's doing you know um value add and they've had tons of experiences where they get into it and the due diligence didn't work out because the deferred maintenance goes further than they thought or you know the books aren't right or or they they Worst case scenario, they buy it and then they find this stuff out, right? I mean, and and you have, you know, when you're looking at a value add, you're you're. I, I've seen most people's models show expenses at fifty percent because you you're going to have HVAC units go out, you're going to have roofs leak, you're going to have you're at the end of or potentially fairly close to the end of life cycles on stuff. You're going to put capex into it. You know, so you're buying it at retail and, and you got a good deal. You know, you got 10% off, but that's all you got off. You got 10% off and then you put it in 15 to 20% in CapEx. So the reality is when your CapEx is expended, you're over market. You've spent more on it than the day you finish spending CapEx, you have spent more on it than it's worth. And now the, the heavy lift really starts. A lot of people think, you know, it starts when you start deploying the CapEx. It doesn't because once you've got the CapEx deployed, You've got to force that appreciation. And as we've all seen in the last eight months, force is definitely the word we need to be using because the market is resisted, right? 
I mean, it, I, I think we can all agree that if we didn't have COVID going on and we didn't have the federal government stepping in on regulations on what you can do with your, your own tenants, and we didn't have you know, the, the difficulty that tenants are having with employment, we wouldn't have had a, any problem with, with appreciation in our rents. But we're struggling with that right now. And, and that's made everybody's life a little bit more difficult. If you look at that from the development side, I went into this deal knowing that it was going to cost me $5.3 million. I went out and I raised $1.5 million in, in equity. I threw in 250 of my own cash. We did the deal. We got a $3.7 million loan. I come to the end of construction cycle in nine months and I'm looking at this project. I can go to 60% rents and still pay my, still pay my lender. I don't know anybody out there that's getting into the value add that can do that with, with a 30% equity raise on the, on, you know, the all in cost. So when I look at that, I can, I have choices. I can either go to 60% rents or I could go to 60% occupancy, or I can do something in the middle. So in my opinion, the ground up is a lot safer in the sense that you have a lot more uh, control and you have a lot less variables that go on. Now, the biggest variable that everybody always knows or always thinks is in there is the contractor. And I get that. As a self-performing contractor, it takes that part out for me. But, you know, that's where using a reputable contractor, you know, everybody gets hyper-focused on, well, I got to get a better price. You got to get a better reputation. You know, you've got to go with somebody that's done this before. You've got to go with somebody that, that can deliver, that's got a 20-year track record of producing and, and, and being able to deliver on contracts uh, and, and not go look for, you know, well, well, this guy's new and his price is really good. And, you know, that's, that's where you're going to get into trouble. But so when people really look at it, you know, I believe, and uh, because I've done both, I believe that there's a lot more safety in the ground up because you don't have unknown variables. You don't have, uh, you know, you're not over leveraged at the time and you're creating that initial value that bringing the sticks and stones together, uh, you know, takes it from 5.3 to 6.3. And on that particular project, we've got an offer coming in at right about 7 million right now. And we're not even done with it, right? So, I mean, obviously throwing another, 20% on there for profits isn't going to piss anybody off. <laughs> well, that was, that was fantastic. Shannon, we've got so many things to go back and peel back, man. You mentioned so many great points there and, and I want to kind of dive into further. And one of them that you mentioned was kind of where we're at in the market cycle now. And, and you're absolutely right. I mean, it's been very hard to transact anything really, in my opinion, for the past probably 18 months, you know, just because it's been such a bullish market. And then obviously now COVID, um, so you're right. I mean, that, that organic appreciation model is just not there right now. So it is making it harder and harder to evaluate opportunities. But in speaking of that, how much does the real estate market cycles factor into you as a developer? You know, is there not to say that you're trying to time the market, but is there a particular cycle that you would prefer to get projects started or that you may, you know, back off a little bit? You know, um, Fortunately, I've, we've had some, some pretty steady growth uh, in Idaho uh, where we operate. But one of the other things that you look at, even when, even when we were going through the Great Recession, uh, multifamily was still fairly strong. Multifamily was a lot stronger than single family. One of the benefits that's come out of the Great Recession, if there is one, is that we're about 2 million housing units short. Doesn't matter who you ask. Uh, we didn't create, you know, we didn't build like we should have for 10 years. And so we've got a shortage. So again, back to what do I have to do? I don't have to time the market, right? Let's go through that and let's break that down. If the market goes soft, what happens to my subcontractors? Price is going to get softer, right? I'll be able to renegotiate my pricing on a project. But at the end of the day, I'm going to be competing with you. And you've got a 1973 converted Motel 6 and a chartreuse shade of beautiful, and I've got brand new. I've got amenities that you can't compete with. I've got, you know, I've got Wi-Fi in the rooms. I mean, I, you know, I have all the, um, all the upgraded things that apartment complexes want now that weren't really a thing in the 80s, right? So I'm going at a different market than you are. 
in in the typical value add. And so I'm I don't really have to get in on timing because I'm going for a, a little bit different clientele. And even if we look at the Great Recession, where we had difficulties in the housing market, the tech world did okay. They held on to their cash because they were afraid of losing, you know, of, of, of you know, losing their jobs as well. But, you know, not the whole market doesn't go to hell in a handbasket at the same time. When lending crashed, it took down a lot of other things, but there were still many segments of the market that were strong that they wanted to live in a brand new place. They wanted to live in, in the, the one with the new and, and modern amenities. And so that's another thing that I think is beneficial, especially with my market and uh, my product type is that I don't have to be smart enough to time the market. Nice. And, and these projects take an extended period of time in many cases to get from the process of planning to actual groundbreaking, right? And it's, and I'm, I can imagine it's varying from market to market or state to state. Uh, I know that you mentioned you're in Idaho, but, uh, you know, like cer certain states, for example, here in Texas, it may take you a couple of years just to get a, uh, a parcel to, you know, be approved by the, the city or county to uh, take that step, you know, into groundbreaking. But how much does that play into uh, the planning? You know, how long are you, t is it taking you to go from the planning stage to actually breaking ground? Well, typically that's about a nine month process is all um, in Idaho. So we can, you know, on the smaller 36 unit project we just talked about, you know, that was um, that whole thing from the time we looked at the property till the time we uh, are complete and stabilized will be 18 months total. Um, and so, so there is some of that. I mean, I've talked to people that are, that are working in LA and, you know, they, they say that it's three years to get the entitlements and then it's another two years to build it. And I'm like, you know, I, I don't know that I'd have the attention span for that. Right. <laughs> but, but here we are, you know, we're able to go fairly quickly. So I can, I mean, I was just talking with a gentleman uh, the other day on nine acres. Uh, we'll have that under contract here this week. Uh, and we will probably have product in the ground this time next year. Um, and so, you know, and the, and the nice thing about that, you know, Cody, from a fundraising side, that gives me time, that gives me runway, you know, because one of the things that you guys struggle with a little bit is, is how you fundraise because you guys are such a, you know, we just found it, you know, we, we've got to, we've got to get going on this. You know, we don't have much time, you know, because it is such a, such a bull market on, you know, on the value add. Yeah, Shannon, that was actually going to be my next question was how does this whole process being in new construction affect the fundraising side? I'm, I'm imagining that you are targeting a specific niche of investor that is a little bit more patient than the average person. Uh, and also as far as the cycle goes, when do you start with your, with your fundraising, with your, you know, capital raising compared to, you know, somebody doing a value add project, like you mentioned, might have to start next week. Uh, knowing that this is 12 to 18 months uh, ahead, you know, I'm assuming it, it gives you a little bit of, or a lot of confidence knowing that I've got time to do my raise. Well, not only that, but you know, you're right. We do deal with the different investors. So my understanding of a value add is that you're, you're combining some upside with growth, right? So you're, you're taking it and you're saying, hey, we're going to take your initial investment of, of 100 grand. And as soon as we get done, we're going to have brought 10% value to that. And then we're going to multiply that value out over 10 years. And in 10 years, you're going to have, you know, you're going to have a 25% increase in, in, in your 100 grand, right? But so you've got two different kinds of people. You've got people like me that are interested in growth. I'm not interested right now in passive income because if you kicked all my money into a pile, it's not enough to support my life at 7% return, right? So you've got my dad who has done that. He's got, he's got enough that that 7% is what he's trying to live on. So he's looking for something and he doesn't like the value add either because he's got to wait 18 months for you guys to paint this thing, you know, to, for you guys to get, get the vacancy filled and, and get all that. But he had to put his money in up front. And so when you go with a, a ground up construction development, we come in, we look at it and we say, okay, listen, Brian, here's the deal. Uh, you're going to get in. We're, we're looking to raise $1.5 million. Our exit is at stabilization. We're going to sell this thing. 
So you're going to come in and, and you're going to be in and out in 12 to 24 months. And you're only looking at growth, right? We're not looking to hold this thing long term because we're looking to grow. Now, if you want to get involved in a long term hold, there's all kinds of other stuff out there for long term hold. But when we're turning 24 to 35% annual returns back to our people, that's all we're looking at, right? And so then that's where we focus on IRAs or borrowing against life insurance policies so that you're in a protected environment so that you're, you're growing and you're putting it right back into a situation where Uncle Sam can't get a hold of it, right? And if you're looking at that and you've done that for a number of years, then you're going to be in a situation where your passive income you know, your, your, your nest egg is up here and your passive income is going to be much larger because you've got a bigger nest egg because of the way that we've done this and you've taken advantage of that organic growth in the first round. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I was kind of hoping to talk a little bit more about, you know, how you are raising your equity through the IRAs and, and whatnot. Uh, and I think you kind of just alluded to that. But, uh, you know, one thing that uh, is also interesting is, you know, we, we typically uh, favor the syndication model uh, for our projects. Uh, you could actually syndicate debt for development projects. Is that correct? Yeah, we do. We do. And so we, you know, we, you know, Brian, to finish out what, what you asked me was how long do I have, you know, I'm constantly introducing projects to people that are coming, you know, coming soon. You know, um, I talked with a couple of, of brothers out of California that very successful and they, you know, I'm laying out a plan for them for the next five years of where they can invest a half a million dollars annually. Right. Because they, they know that I constantly have product churning where, you know, a lot of times in the value add, you don't know you've got a project until, you know, six o'clock tonight and all of a sudden you get that call. Right. But the other side of that is, you know, we're able to buy the land, on, on contract to get the improvements, right? So when I go under contract on a piece of property that says, hey, we're gonna, we're gonna redevelop this farm ground into a multifamily situation, I tie it up contingent. So kind of like your due diligence, right? My due diligence is I gotta be able to build X number of doors on it, right? I just, I just had this conversation uh, yesterday. Uh, the guy says, I want astronomical price. I said, I can give you astronomical price if the city can give me this many doors, right? And so our contract says that I'm going to pay you X dollars and or X price per door, right? So I am contingent all the way through this process. Now, the good news is he doesn't have to do any heavy lifting. He just gets to keep going to, about his farming and I'll take it through the whole city process. And if I can get the 300 doors that he's needing me to get to get to that price, that's great. If I get 225, my contract tells us what the sales price is going to be, right? So I do have that time. And then Brian, I'm coming back and I'm saying, okay, everybody, it's time to jump in. We're ready to close on the land and we're going to use the land as our down payment on the construction loan, right? Because they're wanting the total value. If we've got a $5.3 million value and the land is 400 grand, that's the first thing we buy, right? So I typically come into the deals for about 15% real cash. I don't provide, I don't do any fancy upside on my side. I made the land worth more money and that creates value. I'm, I'm all about just being upfront. This is what we're paying for it. This is the contract. Everybody can see everything all along. And that way I don't have to remember what I said last time. I just pull out the paperwork, right? <laughs> but, but, uh, but what I'm able to do is, is then we go in and we close on the land and then we go to the, we have our, our banking lined up on that. Again, we're not trying to hurry through this situation and have 90 days to close. We've seen this coming for a long time. And we know that 30 days from the time that city council gives us final approval that we have to close on this. So we have that time and everybody's in line and the appraisals are there and everything's there. And, and then we go to close and the fundraising is there in the same way that we would, you guys would do a syndication. I do a syndication because right after that, you know, we've been working on plans and everything along the way. I've got a couple of plans that I kind of like, so we kind of modify them a little bit. We don't change too much. And then we go in and we produce that product. So from the time we close on the land, we're only about 90 to 120 days and we're actually going vertical, right? 
So, so it's, it's a process that, and, and, and I'm assuming this is a larger complex, about 300 units. You know, if we're doing something smaller, you know, the 36 units from the time we closed, we were, you know, I'd owned the land for about a year. We closed on it and we were going vertical the next day. And so then we're in a build cycle and, um, you know, typically it, on a large complex, you're turning over a building every month after you get about nine months in. And so you're, you're doing your lease up on a nice gradual basis. You know, you get 12 units, 24 units that you're trying to lease up. You're working through the project, around the project. You're starting at one end, you're working your way around to the other. So your lease up is not, hey, we got 180 units to fill. You know, it's a logical thing that's happening as you're going along. And so this whole syndication model is exactly the same way as what you guys do, or very close. It's just that when we're done and we're stabilized, we're going to harvest that, that first cutting, that first bit of growth, and we're going to go to the next deal. And we're going to jump into that and, and get another big pop in the next 12 to 24 months. That's awesome. interesting. Interesting. <laughs> So, so how are you structuring this then with the investors? Uh, you know, is it just an equitable share in uh, the, the, the project or, or talk to us a little bit about how you're dividing the equity between the investors? Yeah, so it's really great because I don't really have to worry about a waterfall situation uh, because we're not dealing with ongoing rents, right? I mean, we, we have, w when we're collecting rents in our lease up, we're just throwing that in a pile. Right. I mean, that's just going into a bank account and that's divided at the end after we've paid our, our mortgage, you know, <clears throat> but even then, you know, in our construction lending, all of that is financed in and all of that is accounted for. So we don't have any loan payments for the first 18 months. Right. Uh, that's, that's uh, to say we don't have loan payments isn't correct. We do have, they're just already set aside. Uh, but what I've done is I've come into it and I've said, okay, in the, in the $5.3 million Colorado Commons project, those investors got a 35% equitable position in that, okay? So we knew that we had the appraisal. It wasn't, it wasn't my numbers. It wasn't my spreadsheet. It was the appraiser that said, these are the 10 projects around you. You know, this is, you know, Fannie, Freddie underwriting. This is how this works. This is what the value is. So we could make a calculation based on that and go, here's your 35%, right? So you're looking at it initially, we, we, we see a million dollars in upside, uh, which, you know, they're getting 35% of on $1.5 million brought to the table. Uh, pretty simple math, right? I don't have to, you know, have a calculus uh, calculator. I, don't, I, I just have to be able to do some pretty simple division. As that number grows, they're still 35%. So, the better the market does, you know, the higher we can get the rents. That's just, that's just additional goodies for them. And then we're able to move forward with the rest of it, just like we normally would. I like that. That's great. And in and, and speaking to, you know, the, the debt itself, like you just mentioned, when you're getting these appraisals and you're actually planning for the project, you're basing that off of the, at the completed uh, value, right? The, right. Yeah. <laughs> So because we already have our costs involved, um, the appraisal will give you the, the three contemplations. One is the as is, which is what is your land worth, right? Then there is the as completed, which is what does it cost and what is the value that you create just for assembling those things. And then there is the cash flow analysis that will tell you based on, you know, the three or 10 apartments around you, your median rents, your market time, the concessions that are in your particular market, here's what you can anticipate. One of the benefits and one of the bonuses that doesn't usually get taken into consideration in new construction is all of the ancillary income you can create, right? So there's even more goodies on top of that. That's one of the reasons we're able to look at a $7 million value is because we've created additional revenue streams. We will create additional revenue streams through rubs through, you know, uh, cable that we sell to the project through, you know, covered parking that we rent, all those different kinds of things. We're able to get more revenue out of the deal because we're pushing that ancillary income that's not really considered in the appraisal. 
I'm giving you guys all the tips right here. This is this is <laughs> this, this is a two oh three class. You get you get all the way to the end. Well, that's what we were hoping we were, we were getting when you come on. So uh, I love it, man. This is good. <laughs> Well, we'll talk to us a little bit about the markets that you're choosing to do these development projects in. Again, you know, you, you have a market in Idaho, but, um, you know, as far as your market analysis, how do you know when a land parcel is going to be a good development site? Well, you know, one of the things that, that is, again, it's everybody thinks development is harder and it's not when you're looking at, so when you're looking at value add Cody, you've got to look at whether town is growing away from that area. You've got to look at whether that, that area of town is being gentrified or if it's, in the, if it's in the downward cycle, right? I'm looking at where the growth is and I'm positioning myself right in the middle of the new growth. So I don't have to worry about this area of town for 10 to 15 years, right? And when I'm looking at such a short window of develop it, fill it, sell it, I don't have to deal with a long-term situation but I'm looking at what is happening in that market right now on a micro basis of what is going on today. And what we see in, in our Idaho market is we see not only strong job growth, we see a lot of people, we've seen for a long time where people have been moving into our area because they can telecommute, but the last eight months has made it so that everybody telecommutes. I mean, you know, I don't even know if the guy at the McDonald's window is still there. You know, he's probably calling in from a Zoom call, right? But, but we've, got, we've got a lot of people that are moving in and they're bringing their high paying jobs. But, you know, we've got, uh, you know, we do the same underwriting that you would. But the nice thing is after living in the Idaho market for 40 years and building in it for 25, I don't really have to spend a week and a half diving into what's going on in South Carolina. Or what are the underlying factors in Mobile, Alabama? You know, where is the job growth coming from? I can just drive down the freeway from my office to the house and I can see what's going on and, and what's happening. And, and being plugged into one market, I think, is such a huge advantage because, you know, you guys are in Houston, Texas, and I can guarantee you concrete prices in Texas versus Idaho are very different, right? So if I go into there, come out of Texas and go into Idaho thinking my, my, my numbers are going to be the same, I'm going to be very, very disappointed. Uh, but I can, I can stay in my market. I can stay in my swim lane. I don't have to learn a whole lot more. But at the end of the day, the underwriting is, is exactly the same. And I'm, I'm also looking for large parcels of ground, you know, 12, 15 acres, uh, we do some that are two acre parcels. They're just kind of little infill, you know, 36, 44 unit projects. But most of our parcels are in the way of development. And so we've just got to look at, you know, go look at the city uh, infrastructure improvement map. Go look at uh, where the highway plans on spending its money. You know, we can take everybody else's research and tell you where we're going to go. And, and to get that research, are you just going to the city council meetings? Or are you going to uh, the... Uh... Uh, local. Um... We just go to the municipality websites and we can get most of the information that we need. And then, you know, um, call the, you know, Department of Labor, find out what you're, what you're seeing for job growth. Um, you know, and, you know, some of the things that I've known historically, having been there for 40 years are proving to be untrue as we move into the, you know, the post COVID world. And, and we we're seeing, you know, businesses move in and, and, you know, we've had most of the growth in Boise, Idaho that radiates to Meridian and then not so much in Nampa, but then, you know, Caldwell is kind of coming into its own where now you're having, you know, kind of like the twin cities, you're, you're having growth in Caldwell that has nothing to do with commuting to, to Boise, which is what it used to be. It used to be a commuting community and now it's got industry of its own and it's growing that way. So some of those things are changing and you always have to you know, go back to the drawing board and make sure that your numbers aren't lying to you, that you really are seeing the growth, but we're seeing, you know, phenomenal opportunities. Like I said, I've got, you know, a thousand doors in the pipeline over the next 18 months. So I don't have to go jump on a plane and go find something in Mobile or, you know, Kentucky or, you know, Oklahoma. Not that those aren't great markets, guys. I'm not saying that at all. It's just, I don't know that I have the brain power to, to be able to get in there and, and dive in every single time. And Shannon, being in, in your primary market and focusing on it, I would imagine that's a big reason why you've decided to be uh, vertically integrated. So, you know, tell us a little bit about, you know, that decision and that process and how that benefits you and all your projects. 
Well, I think the vertically integrated part of it, I think is kind of the other way around. You know, we, we've been building for a long time and we've had development partners that we've worked with and things like that. But as we've gotten more into the multifamily, we've seen that our draw there is, is stronger and, and the investment partners that we're getting are, we're getting more of them. And so being vertically integrated is, is really, we bring the building development part to it we're stepping into the syndication model is the new part to us, right? So uh, I've outgrown my partner's wallets is what, <laughs> is what I'd like to say, right? Uh, because we're, we're now, you know, we're, we're in the process of raising $10 million for a, a $40 million apartment complex uh, that we're going to break ground on here yet this year. And that's, that's the biggest raise we've ever done, right? And so that's new to us, but this is the second, 180 plus unit apartment complex we've built in the last 24 months, right? So that part isn't new, but we're having to, yeah, vertically integrate our construction into a syndication model uh, because we're, we're struggling with, you know, my appetite versus the funding that we're, that we're drawing in. Right. It's a good problem to have that. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it is. It, but there are always problems. <laughs> Hey, well, going back to the point of funding, uh, Shannon, is the qualifications as a, a potential um, a buyer, if you will, or developer, is it different from us as being a qualified buyer uh, for an existing asset? Uh, you know, when we think, look at things like liquidity, net worth, and experience, are those still applicable to the development side? Yes and no. I mean, there, there's still, you know, you still need the liquidity, you still need the experience, you still need uh, the net worth, but you need more of it. <clears throat> because at the end of the day, you guys are buying cash flow that even if you screw up, the bank can step in and they can rectify the situation or they can sell what you've got left. You know, if we get halfway through a construction project, the banks, by the time the bank goes through the foreclosure process and everything else that's going to take, you know, we may or may not have a product that's still worth building. You know, it may be, you know, standing at, at the framing stage for 12 months and the framing's all shot. You got to start over, you know. So they look at the liquidity of the net worth a lot differently. Um, so typically, you know, we're, we see higher construction interest rates than you guys are used to when you're, you know, because you're going in and you're buying a stabilized asset, you're getting a pretty decent lending rate up front we're paying a little bit higher than that. So when people look at it and go, well, what's your lending rate? Well, we're at 8%. Really? Yeah, but you got to look at, there is some risk involved. You know, there is a longer duration involved and there is no cash flow during that, even though you've set aside the interest payments. If you're behind schedule and you don't meet that, you're going to run out of money at some point. Typically, we've got another eight months past our construction schedule, but you, you, know, you do have that ability to run out of money just like you would with anything, but there is a little bit more risk. So your, your lending is uh, the, the, the classifications, the qualifications are more on us as developers than it is on the asset itself, because you don't have an asset that is functioning at the point that you take out the loan. Interesting. Okay, Shannon. So, so, all right. So we've, we've built up a team around us. We've, we've, you know, we've got some investors that we feel like have the right appetite for this type of project. We have the right land parcel. Who do we need on our team to get a development project started? <laughs> <laughs> Call me. Uh, well, this is where we flash my number on the screen, right? Um, so, um, you know, the, the reality is, you know, and this is the thing that, that I've seen in the syndication world and the syndication family that I think is phenomenal is just the partnerships that people are, are looking to create, right? I mean, nobody is trying to do a, a single lift by themselves uh, all the time. And, and I see people come, you know, uh, hey, let's, let's co-GP on this, let's do this, let's do that. You know, and that's really where I've seen a lot of my, um, my recent successes come from is people going, hey, we can't find what we're looking for in our normal market in our normal venue. So what have you got that we can, that we can GP with you on? And we found success there. But the reality is if you're looking to do a ground up development, make sure that you're working with a proven developer, just like you would if you're, you know, you're getting into a syndication for the first time, 
Look at people who've done it. Look at people, you know, you guys talk about, you know, the exit cycle. You know, I can tell you right now, I haven't exited one of my deals. I can tell you that right now. But I built over 500 buildings. So I think I have the track record to exit the deals. You know, never been sued uh, on any of that stuff for not completing it. I've never had any litigation, never had any issues like that. So just like you would with a syndicator, you're going to want to make sure that your development partner can deliver what you're, what you're getting in, involved with to do. Because at the end of the day, just like when you got in, involved in your first syndication, Cody, you weren't able to perfect it yourself if your partner died, right? And that's really what you're looking at is to have that development team and that developer. And in a lot of cases, you're going to have three different roles. You're going to have, you know, the, the equity position, you're going to have the developer, and then you're going to have the contractor, which aren't the same where, you know, you're going to have, there's the change order game that's being played, or there's the, you know, the, where, you know, the carpet that you spec is out of stock or, you know, discontinued or whatever. Those are, that's where having a developer builder is unusual, but it's also very, very beneficial because my bottom line is tied. I, may, I make a little bit of money on the construction, but my, my money is made when this development comes off. So the longer we sit around and, and, and bemoan the fact that the, the carpet's discontinued, the, the less money I'm making, I need to get in there and get it built and get it done now and get to renting because I'm not making money until that happens. And so making sure that you get into a partnership where the interests are aligned is very important that your, you know, that your builder developer team is incentivized to get this done, not just get it built, that there's something in it at the end that is bigger than what they're getting along the way. Awesome. Awesome. And so once we've developed the team and again, we have all the other key components in place, we're moving forward on the project. What are some of the challenges that we can expect going through a ground up development? Cause I I'd imagine there's things like, for example, maybe weather or something like that, that could, like you said, slow down a project. What are some things that frequently come up through these projects that could potentially throw you off your timeline? You know, uh, obviously uh, labor shortages can be part of that, but you know, again, back to an experienced team, you know, right now lumber's going nuts, right? Um, we've seen 145% spike in lumber prices. Uh, during COVID, they were down 20%. So the real number is, you know, probably a 35, 40% spike in lumber prices. And we're going to have that carry on for a couple of years. So you're going to have to have a team that knows that, hey, you, you contract your lumber prices as soon as you start. You lock in those buys, you lock in your subcontractors, you lock in your schedules, and you put those contracts all in place so that when the plumber says, hey, I'm short guys, I don't know that I can get your schedule handled. You just remind him that you've got a contract that says that he will get it handled or we will do the necessary things that are that are that we have to to do that. And another thing that I've done in my in my 25 years of construction is I use a, a lot of the same subcontractors so I have a relationship. So it's not a one off, right? So I'm not sitting there and hammering on my guys to to build this as cheap as possible and build it faster and build it this way. When we do a design build, I involve the plumber in drawing the plans because I got a, I got a mechanical engineer, but I, I, I'll tell you, I, my money's on the plumber to do it faster and cheaper, right? He's going to be able to save money because he's not just sitting there clicking and putting stuff together in a, in, a, in a program. He's actually cutting and gluing the pipe together and he knows how to make this as efficient as possible. And that efficiency allows him to meet the price that I need and so we come at the pricing from a different point of view. We come at it from, I've got to get you to $800 a door on your plumbing. And the plumber says, well, in order to do that, I got to do this. Then I'm involving him in the timeline as well so that your team has all of this stuff ironed out because you're going to deal with weather. You're going to deal with spiking in lumber prices and availability. You're going to deal with labor shortages. But having all of that ironed out is like having a great property management and a great CapEx team that's going to come into your value add and go, okay, none of this matters. We're dealing with this through COVID. We're dealing with it right now, you know, and we're, we're still able to execute. So it goes back to your point earlier. Just call you, huh? <laughs> that makes it easier. <laughs> So. Well, man, Shannon, yeah, unfortunately, we're getting near the end of our time here, but uh, Matt, I would love to have you back on the show and actually walk us through uh, a timeline of actually one of the most recent deals that you've done and just sure. kind of 
you know, take this and, and apply it to a deal, man. I'd love to hear more about this. It's such a great topic. And, uh, you know, there, there's been a lot, I know in our network, there's been a lot of conversation around more and more people uh, interested in development uh, for very, for a lot of the same reasons you just alluded to throughout uh, your conversation. So I, I appreciate uh, the insight and uh, I, I know that we've learned a ton, man. <laughs> I had no idea half of this stuff that we've been talking about, uh, which is uh, why we, we love doing this show. So. Well, Cody, Brian, I really appreciate you guys having me on. It's been a pleasure. And, uh, you know, I'd, I'd love to come back and talk through some more and have offline conversations. So I'm totally available. Awesome, man. Awesome. Yeah, I appreciate that. We'll definitely have to get that rescheduled. But not off the hook yet, man. Before you go, I've got four more questions for you, and then we're going to wrap right. up. So <laughs> um, what are you doing for your continued education to further your investing? Uh, so – Every day I'm listening to audiobooks, right? Every day, th this is my front yard. And so every day I'm, I'm, I'm walking three miles and I'm listening to audiobooks, um, you know, just because you've got to continue to grow. You've got to continue to learn. Um, you, can, you can learn so much from other people's experiences. You can learn so much from other people who are specialists in the area. And if you're not continuing to grow, then at that point is when you, can, when you begin the process of dying. And, and so I'm continuing to add to what I know, what I can understand, what I can compartmentalize and process. And so that has to be something that I do every day. Um, the other thing that I do is I like getting involved with people like yourselves where I'm learning something I didn't know anything about, right? I don't understand the value add proposition because I've never been involved in it. And that's something that I want to learn more about. So I'm continuing to seek out people that know more in situations that I don't. And so those are the two things that I do to, to constantly grow. Nice, man. Nice. Um, what have been some of the lasting lessons that you've learned along your journey? Mm, con good contracts make great friends. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if we've had any, any real issues or troubles in our, in our time uh, in, in the construction world, it's been contract based. Uh, and so we've just really, um, learned that if it's in writing right now, we're all getting along. We're all singing Kumbaya around the campfire. Uh, now's when you put it in writing. And if you think that it's not important, uh, you better think that in 24 months because, you know, good contracts make great partnerships and great partnerships lead to great friendships. Uh, but you've got to put it in writing. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. What have been, or excuse me, what advice would you give to the listeners to help them grow their business? Um, you know, <clears throat> this is something that's been a bit new to me. Like I said, the last 24 month foray into, you know, the multifamily syndication group. But the one thing I would tell you is ask everybody, you know, uh, you may ask the same questions to 10 people and get six different answers, but don't try and do this yourself. Partner up with people like you guys that have done this before that are seasoned professionals at this portion of it and learn from others instead of being the Lone Ranger all the time. And especially in the multifamily community, because I haven't met anybody that doesn't want to help. Right. Mm -hmm. And that is something that's completely unusual um, with other, other facets of business. And so you definitely, you should take advantage of that and you should be getting involved in other people's syndications before you go start your own so that you can see how everything is being done and get that lesson up front for free. That's great advice, man. Fantastic advice. Really appreciate that. So, all right, Shannon, tell the listeners how they can get uh, connected with you and learn more about you. Well, you can find us at shannonrobnetindustries.com or Vertical Equity. It's myverticalequity.com. That's our fundraising arm. Um, on there, you can uh, connect with us. You can. We've got a couple downloads there that you can get uh, as far as some tax advice on how to keep Uncle Sam out of your business. You can also check out our construction cameras so you can see what's going on on our job sites. Uh, and uh, they're fun to play backwards because you can see everybody moving really quickly. Um, but those are the places you can find us or on, you know, all the social medias at all the regular places um, with uh, the Real Estate Rundown, which is a podcast I do. Uh, or you can find me just on LinkedIn and, and uh, Instagram and Twitter and all those guys. Awesome. Well, Shannon, thanks again for the great conversation, man. Look forward to having you on the show again yes, in the near you, future. Appreciate it, guys. Thanks again.